Um, welcome everyone to another ANS webinar event. It's a pleasure to have you all here online from near and far as part of the, the Greater ANS uh, webinar series, which today have included topics such as data management, data licensing, data citation, to name but a few. My name is Alexander Hayes and I have with me here on this sunny Canberra day, Jerry Ryder, research data analyst from at ANS who's flown all the way from Fair Adelaide. <laughs> Welcome everybody. South Australia to join us for this important event. And of course, a myriad of meetings that she's doing here. Welcome, Jerry. Uh, for your interest, everyone, and to acknowledge the significance of this webinar topic, uh, it's important to note that we've got attendees registered for this webinar from the University of Canterbury, New Zealand, University of Tasmania, the Australian Antarctic Division, the University of Edinburgh, Chair Sciences Australia, La Trobe University, University of Canberra, Australia, Deakin University, University of Melbourne, Australia, Wiley Publishers, University of Western Sydney, Griffith University, University of Queensland, uh, Research Data Storage Infrastructure, RDSI, Monash University, and that's just to name a few. But a few of these organisations, it's obviously for to whom data publishing is of great interest and an already an integral part of their research activities. So we've got very two distinguished guest today, joining us today, who are we're privileged to have on board, given that the topic at hand is data journals. Jane Smith is the Sherpa Service Development Officer at the Centre for Research Communications, University of Nottingham. In this role, Jane's involved in a number of projects around open access information, including Romeo, the Juliet Open Door, Fact and Jord. And those of you who have been involved in institutional publications and repositories, you'll be familiar with at least some of these acronyms. Jane's here today to talk about the JORD project, the Journal Research Policy Data Bank, which has a particular focus on journal publishers' data sharing policies. We also have with us Dr. Fiona Murphy, who is the publisher for Earth and Environmental Sciences, Sciences Journals at Wiley working with a number of titles, societies and other publishing partners. Uh, Fiona is also increasingly involved with emerging initiatives that promote good management practices of research data, including reuse, uh, use, citation and linking from primary publications. Among other activities, uh, this has led to being a core partner in the prepared project on peer review and publication of data sets and to membership of the STM Association, Association Research Data Group and World Data Systems Data Publication Working Group. Now for a very brief background on ANS activities. During late 2012, ANS staff undertook a desktop survey to identify data journals across a range of disciplines in order to define what a data journal is, to review data journal policies in particular, looking at requirements for DOIs, data deposit and data citation, as well as to assess the status of data journals surveyed, taking into account years established peer review processes and whether they're indexed, in fact, by Thomson Reuters' Web of Science. So we're pleased today to be able to bring together these lead international initiatives and these guest speakers in a webinar that will sure will shed some light on the policies devised by academic publishers to promote linkage between data journals and journal articles and underlying research data. I'd like, now like to introduce to you Jane Smith from the University of Nottingham. Hopefully oh, everyone can see um, the presentation appearing. Oh, here are, um, I've been working on the uh, Journal Research Data Bank, uh, Data Policy Bank, or JORD for simplification. Um, it was just before I talk about what was uh, how, what happened to the, the, the project and findings. I just to give a bit of background. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with it if you're tuning into the ANS uh, webinars, but you just bear with me. Um, data has been becoming an increasingly valuable resource in its own right. Um, people are wanting access to the data behind journals, not just the data in the journal article. So, uh, so they're wanting to access the data sets. Research councils are now wanting uh, that publicly funded research data to be made more available and shared across the communities, uh, as much as an indication that they're spending their money appropriately. Um, and with the changes in research practice and technology, it's now possible to make use of these data sets and collect different data sets for different researchers and 
and extract additional information uh, sort of across the board. As I'm sure you're aware, um, I think it's 2011, ANS had an international workshop, um, and part of this came out the conclusion that it would be a good advantage to collect journals' policies on research data, what the journals and the publishers want the, the authors to do with that data. So JISC, which is what, who funded JORD, uh, through the Managing Research Data Programme, sort of incorporated this idea into it um, and um, <coughs> asked for uh, people to, to bid to look at doing a feasibility study of is, is this actually sensible sort of to do. Other aspects of the programme, including uh, making research data management uh, programs and management strands in various institutions so there's a bit more of an infrastructure to be developed and if the institutions are developing asking the researchers to deposit data they're going to start at wanting to know what the journals will let them do. So in some ways uh, we've been calling it somewhat short and cheekily as the uh, Romeo for data to help people understand. So Jordan's six months feasibility study. Uh, it ran in July, December last year that it was commissioned by JISC and it was run by Centre for Research Com Communications, uh, Research Information Network, our colleague Paul Sturge is at the University of Loughborough that's just down the road from Nottingham and Mark Ware Consulting and together we scoped and shaped a potential service that could provide uh, ready source information for covering journal policy landscape of research data. So we did this in three stages, oh, sorry, I need to have my notes in the right order. Our aims <laughs> uh, were to identify the scope and format of a service to collate and summarise general data policies, but also to investigate and recommend business models, uh, because we just wanted the aim that it would be financially self-sustaining. So those key stages I mentioned. First, we wanted to investigate what was the current state of journal policies on research data. Are there any out there? How good are they? What do they cover? That sort of thing. We also wanted to consult with stakeholders. I'm not just talking about researchers, but the research managers, the funders, the publishers, uh, the support work people sort of who support the researchers, like librarians and repository staff. And as mentioned, we want to look at the business models and what service options are available. Yeah. So the, the literature review. Um, I want to look at what uh, what had been done already in the literature. Had anyone done something similar? Did they have any recommendations on how to do the studies and things like that? So, in summary of the literature review, general thoughts was there wasn't a great deal of literature on this area, particularly on journal policies on research data. There might be stuff about research data, but not necessarily about journals having policies. However, there were some key studies, and these found that a large percentage of journals lacked policies and data sharing. And those studies are the likes of uh, McCain in 95 and perhaps more famously Pua and Chapman in 2008. Uh, I don't have the full references, but I can get them to people if they wish. There's also no standard procedures in, um, sort of across these, from these studies that indicated how, how a journal should create a data sharing policy and what those policies should advise. As might expect as a result of this, is a large deal because degree of inconsistency. Um, some were very vague, some were very clear and cut of what was wanted. There's also little guidance available to the authors. However, some subject areas like biomedical science was leading the way in this area. And also sort of as a perhaps perhaps because of little guidance, researchers' data sharing habits were also quite inconsistent. So with this knowledge, we went to start looking at uh, what policies the journals actually have. And we decided to look at um, what were the highest and lowest impact factor journals and to pick 100 of each of these from the two subject areas covered by the Thomson Reuters Citation Index, so that's Science and Social Sciences. However, as you notice, we only actually looked at 371. This is because there's actually some duplication across these two lists. Um, of those 371 titles we investigated, um, 162, which is 44%, actually had policies. In fact, there's 230 policies, which 
I'll explain a bit later, but it does make sense. But this is quite a good subject coverage. There's 36 subject areas covered across these uh, two lists. We did consider whether or not to contain uh, journals we knew had policies in, but decided at the end to remove these because um, that could give a bit of bias and we didn't actually know where they sat on an impact factor scale. So this is a graph of who had policies. As you can see, the majority of the journals we looked at had no policy. We have some listed as unknown, um, and that's really where we were unable to find a journal website, so we couldn't find it if they had a policy. And we decided not to go, uh, go for direct contact with the journal editors due to the time scale of the project. However, there were several with multiple policies for the uh, journals, about 15%. And this would be where there might be a policy on data sharing, there might be a policy on data preservation, there might be a policy on sort of the formats of the data. And so it was actually the, the multiple policies, uh, the, the pol data policy was spread across multiple policies of the journal. We used Pirwan Chapman's uh, definition of strong and weak policies, uh, which in summary is where strong policies where data put to deposit is a condition of publication. For example, if you don't deposit it, you can't publish. Whereas a weak policy would merely really suggest or recommend the deposit. Based on this, of the journal policies we found, nearly three quarters were weak, with only a quarter being strong. Perhaps, again, not too surprising, the high impact journals were more likely to have a strong policy. And the lower impact journals were more likely to be just uh, recommend or suggest that authors shared data. However, again, as indicated in our literature review, approaches varied between subject disciplines. Uh, with some more established than others. We did, in fact, notice, in addition to biomedical sciences, some of the, um, some of the uh, chemical structure journals had more established practices. So in addition to finding out whether they had a policy, we also wanted to know what was in that policy. So we looked at data types. And with this, uh, we're looking basically what, what, what type of data do they want, to, want the author to deposit. Most of the time we found it was data sets, multimedia, other data, fairly general terms, quite important in terms of data sets, but general, with uh, very few were asking for specific types of data, but those that did were actually things like program code or protein and crystal structure to be deposited somewhere. We looked at where they're asking to deposit. Uh, the greater percentage of the policies we looked at requested materials were put on a website, fairly general again, or just the journal's own website. However, when we did some stakeholder consultation, it was revealed that a lot of the publishers were actually quite keen on well-managed subject repositories, but few were actually specifying then in their journals to do so. We then looked at when was looking at deposit. This is again quite inconsistent across the policies. 23% um, of the policies we looked at uh, asked the data to be made available for peer reviewers, uh, but not necessarily available to the readers after that point. 51% uh, uh, mentioned actually depositing alongside the article. And with some of these percentages, they might be ticking several of the sort of requirements. They might ask for reviewers and to be deposited later and available. So more interesting. At least one journal did allow the inclusion of an institutional website URL uh, as an endnote to this articles, as long as it was a statement there that said the data hadn't been peer reviewed and maybe updated. It did allow for that tying in of the data, the background data to the article. Regarding sanctions, very few, but only 22 of the policies we found, uh, made any indication that if you didn't deposit the data, you might not be published. So we decided to look at consulting uh, stakeholders, and these were really across the board. Uh, scholarly publishers, research funders, research administrators, repository staff, library staff, and the researchers themselves. And we wanted to look at how they currently share data. Do they agree with the idea? Um, do they have any concerns about sharing data? Would they use a service listed journal uh, data policies? And for those that are relevant, would they be interested in assisting with this upkeep? 
So we conducted uh, 23 deep in-depth interviews, and these were mainly with sort of publishers, library, support staff. Uh, we also had a focus group of researchers and a workshop with publishers. Then we did an online survey that was directed at researchers again. And across this, it's found a complex situation with different stakeholder groups making some assumptions about each other's views and what the, their actions. Um, however, majority did support making data open and listed quite a few benefits of doing so. Uh, for example, preserving data for the future, promoting knowledge, reducing fraudulent claims, and, and like, enabling the data to be scrutinized by the community. However, there were some concerns and barriers and caveats. The researchers were concerned about who would own the copyright to the data. Would the data be available in a form that, that it could be valuable to share? A spreadsheet of numbers might not make any sense to another researcher. Do they need another layer or sort of basic analysis before it can be shared? And in some cases of the researchers, particularly early careers researchers, they were concerned that making the data available before they would submitted their PhD could mean their PhD was worthless. So, just to give some of the th three of the main groups and some of their sort of comments. Researchers, they indicated quite, they thought a, a journal policy bank would be quite valuable because it allowed them to access whether a particular journal policy fits their form of data or data sharing ethos or the requirements of their funders. And it can be a point of reference of accessing other researchers' data. The librarians and repository staff, those with a history of librarianship had uh, really not so much knowledge about curating data, but they had similar experience with curating uh, journal and monographs collections and thought this, this knowledge could be transferred. However, in spite of this potential, there wasn't much happening. Um, in the UK, since sort of that stakeholder management, the, the same GISC programme has resulted in several research data management programmes at the various institutions taking part. So that, that picture may be changing. However, they thought the librarians did think that a policy bank would be quite val valuable. Um, it would enable them to support and develop research data management at their institution and would help them gain information, provide publication guidance to the researchers that were interested. Now, publishers obviously uh, wanted to look at what they thought. They thought that the audience for George was a little bit unclear. Was it researchers? Was it the publishers? Was it to librarians. Uh, however, they thought that an accessible list of information on data policies could be fun useful for the funders and policy staff and authors themselves, but especially for researchers to ensure compliance with funders and institutional demands. So, some sort of summaries of the stakeholder consultation. All of the stakeholders recognise the importance of linking between journal content and underlying data, particularly where data is stored, stored in subject-based repositories. There's consensus about the importance of making data as freely available. How is a less unified approach about actually doing so in practice? Um, so some of the common features uh, that came out of the stakeholder conversation of what should be in a George service. There's quite a wide ranging specification and requirements. And if you listed them all together, they're going to be quite hard to, to satisfy everyone fully. However, these are sort of the five common features that came out. We wanted clear, automated, and simple instructions on the service. Clear documentation on the service's aims, its policies, and procedures. They wanted to know for the journal policies, they wanted to know what the conditions of deposit were, would they be able to reuse, how to access, and any restrictions on the data. They wanted guidelines for recommended file and data types and metadata, policy wording, sort of how to write the policies. And they wanted to know where the data could be archived. Almost 80% of our respondents to our online survey, which targeted researchers, answered they would, would use such a centralised service that records the data sharing policies of academic journals. So there certainly was interest in the service. But the big thing is, can it be self-sustainable? So we, uh, having uh, my colleagues developed a uh, potential, based on the stakeholder consultation, some three basic uh, services, and then market tested it, spoke to the stakeholders, which were they more interested in. So the first one suggested was a very basic service. The minimal web interface would have a 
excuse the acronym, an API, an application programmer's interfaces, which would allow machine-to-machine -machine interaction with the database. But it wouldn't be much more than that. The second was an enhanced service, so it'd be the same as the basic, but there'd be additional data integration. So uh, it would link through to, to compliance with funder policies, possibly institutional policies, and it may list recommended repositories for the deposit. Lastly, there was a advisory service. It would be the same as enhanced, but on top of this would be a more advisory um, guides, best practice for writing policies, policy frameworks, and policy language suggestions. In general, the stakeholders preferred the f one of the f one either of the first two. Um, However, when it came to speaking to budget holders, although they were quite positive the idea, um, this, on the sort of uh, research management side, uh, they were less keen on uh, providing the funding. They were, didn't think they could persuade the organisation that was, this was sufficient benefit enough to want the funding. Conversely, the publishers were quite keen on funding, but they wanted a lot more in the service that actually would possibly make it impractical to start off. However, based on this, uh, these three services, options, and stakeholder computations, a full business case was submitted to GISC as part of the feasibility study. A quick summary of the findings of the project. Regarding data sharing, it was felt that this was, this was quite an interesting subject. Um, it was certainly a growing area. There are funders developing, sorry, publishers developing data-only journals, and a rough guide from some previous studies of uh, McCain in '95 and Pirwa and Chapman in 2008. Bearing in mind the different population sizes, there did appear to be an increased number of policies each time people looked at it. So it's certainly an increasing area. However, when it comes to actually sharing information, there's a lot more slower uptake. Researchers uh, were perhaps more likely to share with their immediate colleagues, but not necessarily the colleagues on the other side of the country or the other side of the world. Again, similar reasons down to uh, the hypothetical PhD student mentioned before. They were concerned that other people would trump them in publications. The policies that did exist, uh, it's had a slight possible slight increase in this, uh, this area, but there are still uh, generally poor, not very clear, and they were, they were missing in some subject areas. The general support for a JAWS service, uh, uh, but the, the requirements differ between research and publishing communities. So uh, although there's some five common features, it, there could be some issues of, of how to go about. However, the uh, data is in an increasing area, so a JAWS service could benefit the future in this area. And it could help build while the numbers of policies are smaller, a bit better than the discussion, and build now. So George recommended to JISC uh, a two-phase study, or two-phase uh, procedure to go ahead. Phase one would be grant funded, and it would build a simple service, focusing on getting the, an, a good data set of the policies, uh, with simple technology, then use that to build engagement with stakeholders, build awareness, establish a need for the service, and there could still be that machine-to-machine -machine interface with third parties creating applications on top of it, and also to further develop the self-sustaining model. Phase two would implement the self-sustaining model, um, and there might be a need for some additional funding uh, before breaking even, but there could also be uh, opportunities for grant funding, research and development activities. So some final thoughts on what we found for the George survey. George service. Uh, the user base for um, a George policy bank would probably mainly be people on service that work within and support the research community. A lesser number of users would be publishers and funding bodies, uh, so representatives acknowledges some, there's some use for collation of the journal data policies that we found. Such a service could provide easy access to journal data policies, provide clarity on when, where, and what to deposit, provide guidance on file and metadata formats, and help librarians and support staff to enable researchers. 
as I mentioned, there's currently a small number of policies available. We're talking in the hundreds, uh, if we take into account previous studies. So building a George type service would be much simpler and likely to be built sturdily if done now. And would enable the introduction of good practice now before the policy numbers increase dramatically and no one has an idea what <laughs> to do with them. So at the moment we're waiting a decision from JISC on how to take the George concept further as they consider our feasibility study. So my recommendation to you is get involved in research data. If your institution has a research data management plan, get involved. If it hasn't, encourage the powers that be that it's a good idea. So, uh, so that's a few references uh, there in, in short. As I said, I can provide them in full if required. So if any questions? That was a really interesting presentation. Um, and having done a very small desktop survey of um, journal data policies, I um, applaud the rigour of the work that was done by Jord and, and re recognise it was no small task. Um, what we might do is move straight on to Fiona and then perhaps take questions um, afterwards. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, Fiona Murphy, who has been involved um, in a sister project with a uh, uh, sister project to Jord but also has some uh, experiences in her role from Wiley as well. So Fiona, uh, I think we should be able to see your screen now. Yeah, can you? Yes, beautiful, thank you. Yep, it says showing screen here. Okay, right, I'll take it away then. Thanks. Um, I'm gonna say it, good morning everybody. Um, and obviously good afternoon to to most of the people here, and thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak to you today. Um, I just wanted to, to say I'm going to um, uh, talk a bit about um, some of the things that I've been doing um, around publishing research data, and also sort of um, touch on on some other things that are going on as well. Um, I wanted to start though with um, just a couple of, of what and why slides, just to make sure that um, we're all maybe starting from the, the same starting point. So here you go. So what do we mean by, by publishing data? Um, I think it's analogous to, but not precisely the same, as publishing primary data. Uh, no, no, I'm just trying to get um, your square a bit smaller, because it's really massive, and I can't actually see my own slides very well. There we go. There we go. Um, and it's not it's like precisely the same as, as publishing primary research. Um, in, in so far as um, primary research output is generally a, a finished product, whereas whereas um, the data underlying it is, of, is often um, raw or in various sort of states of, of partial process. So data should also be, and now I can't, <laughs> there we are. It should be permanently um, or long term archived in a reliable repository. And I put reliable in quote marks because I think that can be a, a problematic concept all, all on its own. Should be allocated a persistent identifier. Um, I would say DOI, but um, I think there is also there are also problems around you know, the nature of different kinds of data sets, which can mean that um, a URI um, or even a, a web link is is the only thing that's possible for in certain cases. And there should be um, a critical level of, of metadata to allow discoverability. To, to enable people to, to, to find um, a particular data set and to know what it is that they're looking at. And then the why. Why would we publish data? Well, there's a very good reason to, um, to provide academic credit to um, the scientists, particularly the kinds of scientists who traditionally haven't been able to accrue publications and the, the kind of status and career path that, that um, go along with that. And also, um, the publication path is, is one which, which is known within research communities um, and, and could be incorporated into, into current um, re research and proposal grant workflows. Hopefully, it ensures that the data set is, is uploaded to, again, a, a trusted repository um, and you can, you can have some um, reliance on, on of archiving and, and curation practices. And again, I think that's something that, that's emerging as a, as a, a need for a more sort of general and better understood um, best practice or sort of standards and accreditation rules. Um, got peer review processes. And this is another thing that um, 
I think. I'm sorry, I can't, couldn't switch my Skype off. If that's if that's annoying people, I hope it's not too bad. Um, it's peer review. Um, I think that's another another part of the the, the data publication process, which um, is again analogous to um, the primary research piece, um, but it's also not exactly the same. It gets, it's um, it's something that people have a great deal of, of issue with um, because of the, the size of potential data sets, time, that um, or the skill that might be required to um, to actually uh, manage a peer review. And the fact that um, it's quite well known that reviewers are already under a great deal of, of strain and time pressure. So um, that's that's a potential sort of pain point in the process. Um, Publication of data, again, if we're saying that it would then become more discoverable, more permanently available, um, then, you know, hopefully it would, it would then be more visible to people, you know, who aren't necessarily in the know immediately to, to be able to, um, to find and reuse. And transparency, um, it, it, you know, it, it should also, um, you know, support the, the, the movement towards, you um, <sighs> Accountability to the public and to the funding agencies, um, given that you know, a lot of money does get spent in in research, and uh, you want to see what it is you've got. And that felt that's the other the other really good reason why why you'd want to, to publish the research because it's the way that so the research data it's the way that the wind is just generally blowing. Um, many of you are probably aware that um, the White House um, Office of Science and, and Technology Policy had a, a big meeting last week about public access to um, federally funded um, research and they spent half the time talking ab about data as opposed to, to just um, uh, I suppose the, the regular or standard um, you know, research output. Um, Science is an Open Enterprise report um, came out at the end of 2011 I believe and um, it's, um, it's a very interesting report um, and it, it, it does make the case that, um, that Science and you know, thereby all kinds of research uh, should be um, open up to um, the people that paid for it and anyone that wants to use it, and people should be able to find their way around in it. Um, and in fact, it's um, I've heard the uh, the report's main author speak, and he makes a very clear case that librarians are our key to to this um, new paradigm. And Horizon 2020 is another one I just I just picked is um, the EU's program that's the European Union's program for research and innovation. They've got a budget that was um, 80 billion euros. I think it might have been cut a little bit, but um, they're, they're absolutely um, placing a, a, a top priority on um, opening up research and, and allowing um, also facilitating and um, the capacity to to build data set knowledge um, to be able to um, uh, find interoperability and synergies and to, to drive new um, insights and, and business models and, you know, and growth and jobs and generally they, they see this as being um, really key to, to, to Europe's long-term viability and, and uh, prosperity. So what do publishers do? Well, one of the things that, that we can do, I guess, uh, um, is our sort of knee-jerk reaction to most things is start a new journal. So Geoscience Data Journal um, is, a, is a partnership um, between Wiley and um, the World Meteorological Society. Um, and uh, it's also been supported by NERC, which is the Natural Environment Research Council in the UK. In particular, the British Atmospheric Data Centre um, has been very helpful, giving us a lot of time and, and people space um, to, to work through how we might, how we might set this up and, and make it work. As you can see, um, we publish short data papers which are cross-linked to and which cite data sets that have been deposited in an approved data center and awarded a DOI or, or another permanent identifier. I've also put a, a little description here of what, a, what we believe a data article is and, um, and why, and why it's, it's a good thing to do. As you, as you see, it's the when, the how, the why the data was collected and what the data product is. And um, it, it's a way of, of pulling together all the, all the um, parts of the, the, the project, the output, that would um, enable your reproducibility um, and also reusability. So I've also I've put a, a, a splash page here um, of a, what the article looks like. And I wanted just to draw your attention to the fact that there we've got the, the DOI of the article itself. But we've also put the, the DOI of the data set up there on the front page. Um, we felt it was it was really important to have have it um, sitting um, 
you know, up, up there amongst the front matter, really prominent, so that people can can see how it um, sort of relates to the article overall. Um, I did want to mention as well that we we also put the DOI in the reference list um, because we're we're wanting to to support the, the general citation of of data sets. Um, and we're also mindful of the the Thompson Data Citation Index, which is which is being um, pulled together at the moment. And we want to make sure that um, that we, we support whatever um, working workflows that that they eventually come out with. So um, I've got here on the left um, a picture of of um, the workflow as we as we envisaged it at, at the beginning. And as you can see, there's um, it's pretty complicated. There are a lot of processes, and there are a lot of um, parts where we felt the um, the researcher has almost been kind of battered between, say, the publisher and the editorial process um, of the primary research paper, but also um, the repository and and the the data set itself. And we felt that um, you know it, it, this is a potential um, barrier to to people really um, picking up and, and and running with them with this sort of um, publication. So we started, um, you know, isolating, trying to name the the issues we felt were, were the key ones. And so there was a workflow and cross-linking issue. The, you know, the journal and the repository need to be able to speak to each other. Um, we need to know um, something about the repository in order to be able to work with it, including, um, you know, whether, whether it's whether it's going to be here next year. You know, what 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 happens to a data set that that goes into that repository? Um, I felt that it was. Um, in, intrinsic to um, calling something a journal is that there should be peer review. Again, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, peer review of, of data sets is um, it's, it's a big ask um, and people aren't really clear what it is they're supposed to do. And um, and just, just generally, um, I think um, Jane touched on it as well, that um, you know, people um, you know, researchers, um, they are being slightly, slightly pushed towards behaving in this sort of way, but they're also um, having to operate in the, the real world where um, if, you've, if you've painstakingly compiled a data set, you, you don't want just to be without achieving any, any credit um, yourself. And it's, um, it's important to be able to, to engage with people and um, answer questions, address concerns, and, and adapt as, as required. So um, we felt that the, the, that also boiled down to the, the need for um, a better understanding of how in this sort of a publication, um, a journal and a repository uh, would, would interact. In which case, um, we, we started um, working on the prepared project. That's where that came in. And again, like, like George, it's, uh, it's JISC funded um, and they're managing research data strand. So um, I've put up, up here the... Um, the key partners, um, the contact details of the project leads, and as you can see, we're coming towards the the end of our, our cycle. So um, we've got some, some outputs, and we've got some some finals, and concluding, I'd like to, to point out. So one of one of our work packages, one of the one of the um, areas we've been investigating is repository accreditation. Um, because clearly, if you've got a data paper, uh, the data set, there needs to be a very you know a, a strong durable link. Um, but there are um, a lot of questions that that you know we 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 have to find we have to know on an individual basis if a repository is trustworthy. But um, we then we need to have some way of of um, uh, sealing that, of of publicising that, and of um, generally ensuring we don't have to keep duplicating that work every time every time um, we either start a new journal or another publisher wants to work with that repository. So. Um, we were, we were looking to um, to see how to start pulling pulling that um, insight and information together. Um, as you can see, we've put um, a list of the characteristics that we we've been looking at around the accreditation um, and the um, how you assess whether um, a repository is is um, good to work with. And um, we've actually we're in the process at the moment of um, refining some some recommendations. Which um, I'll give people a, a note of how to um, to interact with in a moment. Which is the um, second um, key area of our, of our studies is the peer review of data. Um, as you can see, we had a, we had a workshop uh, a couple of months ago, and um, we decided that we had three recommendations: um, the need to connect data review with data management planning. So to um, 
to basically pull the data management plan, which hopefully happened much earlier in the process, with the review, which then happens at the end. So you can connect what was the what was the project what, um, supposed to achieve, what was the what was the data that was supposed to come out, and how is it supposed how is it supposed to be collected or or used or assessed. Um, we wanted to um, show that there, there's a, two sets of reviews. There could be a scientific review, there could be a technical review, and these both um, needed to be uh, reflected in in the curation and the information that was held about the data set. So, um, and we also wanted to um, connect the processes of of the data review with the article review. Um, as you can see, we've we've got a, a formal um, document for comment, which um, is up on that URL there. And um, there's a, also a, a mail list, this uh, the data publication um, uh, email address, which um, it's, it's very easy to, to join and to, to comment on. I'd be very happy if you, if you were to do that. You can also find, uh, if you join the list and then um, go back through some of the previous posts, um, you can also find the material around the, um, the uh, repository accreditation. So most recently, we were looking at, at cross-linking um, workflows. So we only just had the work, um, workshop on, on that one. And so I've just put the, some preliminary findings from that. Um, the loudest voice, actually, was, um, as I was touching on before, the need for there to be some sort of central registry of broker. And that's partly, um, I think, also related to the um, accreditation issue. But it's also to do with the fact that, at the moment, um, all the, the links are, are bilateral. And, um, and any information uh, that's sent between them is um, largely manual, and um, and that's it's just not going to be workable to to try and, and, and build that up. If you can imagine, um, that in a world where um, a lot of um, data sets are being cited, um, and you're wanting to um, collect, catch, capture um, information about who's cited what, um, has a an article cited a data set has a um, a data paper pulled together, you know, multiple data data sets, and and then cited them. That um, we we just um, you know they could be sitting in different um, data centres, um, and they, we we just can't keep a, a track on that manually. Um, I think something along the lines of um, like cross ref cross ref um, brokerage, um, maybe something around um, Thomson Reuters and the ISI might be a, might be a possibility, but. Um, it feels that, that pe if in order for people to be um, incentivized to publish data sets, we need to be able to collect the, the citations, and that then needs to be done in a manageable way. Um, and as we said, so data citation, I think, is also emerging as um, a currency that, that's understood amongst um, researcher communities. Um, and the, in fact, data, data citation is like publication of data. It's analogous to, but not exactly the same. As, uh, as primary research, um, if you can imagine, if you've got a long-term um, observation uh, data set in in the atmospheric sciences, um, a data set could be could be cited, and then the same data set could be cited a year later, and it would in fact be a different data set. So there there's a certain amount of of something being fixed and yet not fixed, uh, which you, you certainly don't get with primary research articles. But the concept of citing data set. Is, is something that um, I think many of us are, are familiar with. So um, I also wanted, in the interest of fairness, um, to, to mention, you know, obviously, um, while I'm not the only um, a scientific technical publisher, um, and we also um, I'm, I'm also aware of, and in fact, applaud the fact that um, many many publishers are um, exploring uh, this this area, and I think it, it's a sign of its of its growing. Um, <sighs> importance and, and people just realizing that that that, um, that this is going to be critical for, for underpinning scholarly communication going forward so um, this I've just put a few um, journals and um, publications um, down here to, to illustrate that and I'm aware this is by no means exhaustive we actually do have quite a good list on the prepared website that was one of the things that we, we did was to um, pull together a list of, of data journals which again people are welcome to go and have a look at but um, Earth System Science Data um, is an EGU publication um, it's it's open access it's been going for about four years um, and it's it's um, fairly similar to um, Geoscience Data Journal. It has a, an open peer review 
system. And at one point it was also publishing supplementary information which, which we decided we didn't want to do. Um, I think they, they've now, they've now um, tightened up their, their criteria. Um, scientific data from Nature was um, announced very recently. Um, and I think that that was, um, that was a real signal, um, I think, of, of, um, of the importance um, that, that this topic's um, starting, to, to, starting to assume. Um, the, the scientific data is going to be um, published in what, what then they've termed data descriptors. Um, which I think are, are pretty much um, data papers, data articles, but um, I mean, it, it, it hasn't yet um, formally launched, so I think that's just a space to watch and um, get more information about as we go forward. Um, Giga Science by Med Central is very much a, a life for medical sciences, um, it's a big data project, um, and they, the Giga, Giga Science also uh, undertakes to um, hold the data set um, as part of, of the publication. Um, and faculty of a thousand research, F thousand research. Um, this is um, another um, quite new entrant into the field. Um, again, there's it's they have um, open and open peer review, which is also post publication, um, which is another one maybe to, to have a look at. It's also in the, the, the life sciences, medical biomedical sciences, um, and but it's. Um, also um, building up partnerships with um, some of the, the, the um, sort of data centers such as Figshare, which um, will take um, your uninteresting data sets and allocate a DOI. You know, they're, they're interested in publishing negative results to, um, to just generally build the, 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 um, the canon of scientific technical knowledge. So I also um, thought it might be useful to, to mention a couple of, of things that um, you can go away and do you know, after this session. Um, you can have a look at our, our site, uh, um, which has got quite a lot of information about um, the um, work packages and the um, output that, that we're conducting, um, and also you know, the blog and you know, the, you know, the mailing list as well, and very, very welcome to, to join or interact with that. Um, more widely, there's a, a GISC mailing list, which, um, relates, uh, which relates back to the website. Um, I mentioned earlier, and um, that's that's quite interesting. That that's very international. It's got a lot of um, librarians, data center managers, publishers, um, kind of interested um, researchers um, who who are all trying to to engage around this, and, and it is picking up. I think on a lot of the things that are, are going on that that other organisations are are um, in, engaged with. Um, Research Data Alliance, um, again, is quite another quite a new initiative which um, I know um, Anne's um, is, is very involved with, um, which I think is at a, at a point where it's, it would be um, quite interesting, quite, quite useful to, to, um, to, to at least engage with joining some of the mailing lists because there are a lot of working groups which are just getting off the ground at the moment, some of them around things like data publication, data citation, um, capacity building, and so forth. So, um, and at the very least, um, you know, it's, it's, you can keep an eye on what's going on just by, by being aware of them. Um, the World Data System um, is um, sort of another international organisation which is encouraging a membership. Um, again, uh, um, I'm aware that the Australian Antarctic Data um, Centre is is certainly a member, and the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Um, but it's it's um, Generally, it has a mission to um, you know, support the best practice of stewardship, curation, research data, and um, and you're you're invited to um, support the mission. Um, you can become an associate member, which doesn't involve paying any money, but which does involve um, you know, being called to the table to to actually you know, engage with and support the uh, sort of policies as they're, as they're emerging, as they're worked through. And it's with, a, with an idea of joining things up and supporting interoperability um, and not reinventing the wheel as well. And I think um, that there is an, a potential issue with there are so many things going on at the moment that people could well be working in isolation and, um, and uh, say, reinventing the wheel in several different places at once, but I think um, Research Data Alliance, the World Data System, are very much looking to see what's already out there um, and what's, what's good practice, where the low-hanging low fruit is, and to, um, to actually you know, build, build from there and, um, and support the things that are, that are already happening. So, 
in the future, a little bit of a, a blue sky moment, um, hopefully I'll know a lot more about the future um, tomorrow because there's, there's, a, there's actually a, a meeting in Oxford. I've put the, the program there. Um, we're hoping to have at least some of the, the sessions um, um, broadcast or recorded, but um, hopefully there'll be a, a Twitter feed as well. And and, um, and we'll, we'll try and make sure that there are some, there are some outputs that come out from that. More generally, I think um, <laughs> the sense that the stakeholders in this, in scholarly communication, um, are, we're, we're, in, we're in a shifting landscape. Um, I think it's really important that, um, that we speak to each other, that, that we're, we're adaptable. Um, and I think that there's, there's just so much to do that there should, there should be space for, for all of us within that. Um, and I think that, that journals and scholarly communications are going to start really changing um, in the not too distant future. Um, I think there'll be um, there'll be more enriched content. There'll be more tools for query. Um, I think um, things like copyright and, and ownership are going to become they're going to they're going to adapt. They're going to change. I'm not going to say they're not less not so much important, but I think um, they're they're going to be um, important in a different way. And that's it. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Fiona. Firstly, for getting up such a, an early hour to uh, connect with us, but really for leaving us with a great deal of um, options as to how we can connect and uh, communicate with not only with your initiatives, but many others. Uh, it's of great interest to all of our uh, ANS partners and to the other people who will interact with this resource well and truly beyond this. So thank you uh, for, for uh, your, your input. We've also got a number of questions that have come in uh, that are both addressed to both um, uh, yourself and Jane. So we might start, uh, if we may, start with Dave Connell who's waited patiently to ask the question of, um, of, of uh, Jane. He was referring to a slide that you had raised earlier, Jane, and I think it was uh, referring to the survey that you'd undertaken as part of your project. Uh, yes, the whole study happened in July and December last year. Um, so the the journal, the survey of the journal policies, we were sort of the beginning of that sort of period, I think through to about October, November. Um, the online survey of the stakeholders was sort of November, December. At the time, so we are aware that things may have happened since uh, the project finished. Right. Thank you very much for answering the question. And Jerry's got a few questions here as well. Uh, yep. So one of the another question for Jane was around your business case to JISC, and um, when you the timing when you might expect to receive a response on that. Uh, I'm afraid we don't really know. Uh, we talk sooner than later. Um, and the GISC has undergone quite a bit of restructuring lately, so that's delayed a lot of their decision-making process. Um, so I'm afraid I don't know. <laughs> okay, we'll just have to watch with interest, and I'm sure it'll come out yeah. on the appropriate lists as well. And certainly if we find in, if I hear anything out, we'll try and put up on the uh, blog that I believe you put up at, towards the beginning. I do apologise for missing that from my slides. That's fine. No, thanks for that, Jane. Um, another question, uh, probably really for Fiona, was um, around the data citation, um, where we where we saw on your um, screen splash um, some metrics that you were capturing there for the Geoscience Data Journal, uh, or alt metrics perhaps. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how you're, I guess, trying to integrate the data citation aspects into the Geoscience Data Journal? Um, Let's have a think. So, um, well, there's, there's a lot of work being done around data citation at the moment. Um, so, what we thought was important was that um, when we are right, when, we, when we've got the um, the data article, the um, data set or data sets uh, which, which which it's being based on um, should be in the reference list um, to um, support. Um, the data citation index as it as it emerges. Um, that sort of thing. Uh, is that is that what you mean? Um, you mentioned alt metrics. Um, with all the um, open access journals, geoscience data is open access. We we um, collect and, and publish 
um, the download information as well. Um, and in fact, as a as a company, Wiley has just we've just started um, uh, a pilot scheme with with um, Altmetric. Um, not around this journal, I'm, fr I'm afraid, but around um, you know a, a pilot of about ten journals um, to to take that the full Altmetric service. You know where, where you're compiling um, you know influence around you know blogging and tweeting um, and so forth, as as well as um, citations and downloads. Does so that make sense? Um, yeah, no, it does. And I guess perhaps what that suggests is that we can expect that alt metrics may be may grow in, I guess, their influence over time, as well as the more formal site, sort of citation um, indices as well. I think so. Have you seen um, just in the last week or two? Um, there's a, a, a petition called Dora that that's been springing up. Um, and it's actually quite a large number of, of um, people that work on journals, um, and including the altmetrics um, groups, um, to um, and it's a call to funders to, to place less um, emphasis on the impact oh, yeah. factor and on the citations. I have. Yeah. So um, have people come across that? Um, and you, you can sign up for uh, you know to support it, or you can sign up for more information. Um, but I, th I think that um, that that is something that will that will increasingly you know gain currency, you know from the funders. And in the, and in the end, that that they're the people that drive the behaviour. No, it's interesting how these uh, metrics are evolving over time. Yeah, thank thanks for that, Fiona. That's great. Uh, we don't have any other questions uh, that are posed here, but we're very uh, aware that uh, many people may have questions in the near future. So what we would like to do is to be able to thank you both very much for attending our, our Data Journal's webinar today, Jane and Fiona. Uh, it's a great privilege for us to hear from you both. And we're sure that any questions that do arise in the future, we can uh, most definitely steer them towards you both. So thank you very yes, much for attending. Please do. Yep. Please send them on. Yes, yeah, certainly will. Okay, thank you very much for attending everybody and we're looking forward to connecting with you in the near future.